Hi, everyone. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk to you about uh, multi input functional encryption uh, for inner products. Um, yeah, so I will talk about function hiding and um, unrelated how to construct uh, multi input functional encryption uh, without pairs. So let's get this started um, with some motivation. We um, uh, have this context of a server that manages emails and would like that uh, it only has access to encrypted emails. So emails are uh, encrypted with the public keys of the users. And um, the goal would be that the server can compute uh, the spam function. Does this work? Oh. Yes. The, 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 the server can compute the spam function on each email and decide if emails are spam but it cannot uh, actually read the emails. Like This is the only information that is being leaked. And this is uh, a nice motivation for why functional encryption is interesting. Um, functional encryption is, encryption is just a generalization of public key encryption. So if in public key encryption, when you decrypt a message uh, with a secret key, you get the message. In functional encryption, decryption keys are now associated with functions. And we also have master keys. So if you want to decrypt a, a message with the decryption key associated to, to, to function f. Instead of getting the message, you get the function of the message. Uh, but where do these master keys uh, come into play and where do this uh, SKs, uh, SKF come from? Uh, basically, we have also a master authority in our model. And if Bob wants to decrypt something that he got from Alice, uh, this separate text event, he needs first to ask the function to the wizard, which represents the master authority. And it, uh, he'll get the, the function of the message. So this is why we have the master keys and the decryption keys. Great. Now what is multi-input functional encryption? Uh, this is a notion formalized in 2014. And in this context, instead of wanting to decrypt just one ciphertext, we want to decrypt n ciphertext at the same time. But the catch is that the ciphertexts are generated uh, independently. So uh, this, this one over here is generated independently from this one over here, so with fresh randomness and completely separately. Uh, and when you want to when you try to decrypt, you decrypt all the messages at the same time. Uh, yeah, all of them at the same time. So that's what's written here. They are independent. So the function now is a function that takes n inputs. It has n arity. Um, and the last thing that I want to introduce before I state the contribution uh, is um, we work, we look at uh, schemes for specific classes of functions, in this case, the inner product. And uh, we would, uh, in, in this context, the function is just, uh, the functions are associated to vectors y, and um, uh, the function is just the inner product of the input with y. So if you have, uh, so, the, the messages are now vectors, and when you decrypt, you obtain the inner product of x and y. S similarly, in the multi-input uh, setting, you have x, uh, you have n uh, input vectors, and when you decrypt, you obtain a big inner product, so keys now are now associated with n small uh, y's, and you get the big inner product of everything. So again, recall that this thing is independent from this thing. It's like, uh, they come from different places. <laughs> So previous work on this, uh, since the seminal paper in 2014, we have seen a lot of, um, uh, a lot of work in the field, uh, and they achieve uh, multi-input functional encryption for a wide variety of functions. Uh, but most of them rely on complicated assumptions like I.O., multi-linear maps. Um, and then in 2017, uh, so not very efficient I.O. and multi-linear maps, uh, and then in 2017, the question was asked if we could actually have efficient schemes, like things, schemes which we can actually implement in practice. And um, uh, this paper uh, presented a scheme that worked for the inner products uh, with uh, supporting a polynomial number of inputs while only relying on polynomial hardness assumptions. In this case, the assumption was XXDH in pairing groups. Uh, and also concurrently with our work, uh, uh, at the beginning of this year, the same, uh, the same result has been obtained, uh, but for unbounded polynomial number of inputs. So now the, the inputs are not uh, being set uh, at the setup, and, um, um, but also from pairings. So what do we do? Um, uh, we complement a little bit the figure by uh, proposing two schemes. 
The first one is um, uh, a multiple function encryption for inner products in which we remove the need to rely on pairings. So now we, we, we can construct schemes that uh, have the same functionality but uh, can be based on DDH, DCR, or LWE. Uh, and we also propose the function hiding scheme uh, concurrently with this 2018 paper. Uh, uh, but uh, in a uh, uh, slightly weaker, like in a weaker model, because uh, here they can do unbounded, and we don't have this. Okay, so now let's move on to the presentation of the model. Yeah, so in this talk, I will talk more about the, the construction without pairings because there is no time to talk about everything. So, what is the security goal? Um, the security goal would be that if you have the encryption of the, of the vector x, and if you have an encryption key associated with y you would like to leak only the inner product of x of y, y, and the size uh, of the message which we usually leak in, in, uh, in the crypto. So the only information that's leaked about x is the inner product uh, of x with the key. And in multi-input functional encryption, of course, similarly, you have n ciphertexts, and you'd like to, that the only leakage is uh, this big inner product, big, with the concatenations of vectors x's from different sources, and the y's. This is how you would expect the leakage to look like, but it's actually not that simple, so it's more complex. And now I will explain, explain why uh, this leakage comes from the model. And the reason is that these ciphertexts are independent, so uh, they come from different sources, different computers that talk, for example, with a cloud that has a secret key. Um, this is the functionality that we get, but the goal would be that uh, we only get the inner product of the big vectors and not, um, and this should be the only information that we obtain and not uh, independent inner products like Xi or Yi. So only the inner product of the big ones and not the inner product of the small ones. That would be the goal. Um, but uh, this doesn't make sense in the public key setting uh, in the sense that it's an inherent leakage. So in the public key setting, if the adversary has the master public key, uh, it could just uh, in encrypt, uh, if the adversary has access to, the, to this encryption key, it could just encrypt zero, and then it would construct this big vector in which it concatenates, uh, it, it, it puts zero on every other slot except for the i. On the i slot it puts x, the rest are zeros, and when it decrypts it obtains x i y i. So this uh, small inner product is inherent leakage in the public key setting, and it's too much, and so we looked at the symmetric key setting, uh, and to finish the presentation of the model, we, I will talk a little bit about uh, ciphertext mixing. So what you would like to be, what, what is multiple input functional encryption about? Uh, you would like, to, uh, if, if the cloud obtains uh, multiple ciphertext from, uh, a dip, from uh, the same source, so in this case, ciphertext for x1, x1 prime, and from another different source, it obtains x2, x2 prime, then it should be able to compute all the combinations. Um, and uh, for two, it's, you'll get four combinations. For n, you'll get an exponential number. And um, we want to allow ciphertext mixing. We want to allow uh, our scheme to decrypt uh, ciphertext that come from dif uh, uh, different sources. But at the same time, we don't want to allow key collusion. Like we don't, we don't want to be able to take two keys and mix, like somehow mix them together and obtain another one with new information. So ciphertext mixing, but not key mixing. Um, and now, the, I just formalize the security notion. I, I will just not formalize it. I will just explain it in a very informal way. <laughs> um, so assume that this challenger here, the owl, has run the setup and has the master public key and the master secret key. And this evil horse, which is an adversary, he hates, he hates the owl, um, he has access to two oracles. So he can either uh, query the keygen oracle on uh, vectors y, y, one, n, y, n, and get decryption keys, or he can query the encryption oracle on uh, a specific uh, slot, which uh, a specific input i, with x i, and he will get uh, it will get encryptions. Uh, so these two oracles are actually interleaved. It can first call the first one, and then the second one, and then the first one, second one, uh, or maybe first one three times, and so on. But they are interleaved, and uh, the goal would be that it only gets the beginner products and not. Um, uh, maybe not small ones, not, this should be the only information, and well, the only information that uh, the adversary gets should be information derived from this. 
this is a very informal description of how it looks like because uh, we actually rely on, we actually achieve indistinguishability security and this is more, looks more like simulation. Okay, so a roadmap of our construction. Um, we, um, uh, I will show you first um, a very easy way to achieve security for one ciphertext query uh, coming from one input source. And then uh, I will show you how to bootstrap this to one ciphertext query, but for many input sources. Um, and then in parallel, we will also go to many ciphertext queries uh, and one input source. So why do we, do we have to go from one ciphertext to many ciphertext? Well, it's because we work in the symmetric key setting. So one ciphertext doesn't trivially imply that we also have security for many ciphertext queries. Uh, and in the end, we'll put everything together in, in step four, and uh, we will have our final scheme. So again, we only need to, we need to go from one to many, one ciphertext query to many ciphertext queries because we don't have uh, this trivial implication. Uh, so let's start with one ciphertext uh, and one, uh, in, from one input source. This is just one, a one type pad, uh, very simple. The master secret key, it's a uniform vector U from ZQM. Uh, the encryption is just the one-time pad of X with U, and the key generation will be Y along with the inner product of U with Y. So why does this work? Well, it's because, uh, for, for example, if I wanted to decrypt, I would just take the, the ciphertext, I will make the, cipher, the inner product of the ciphertext with Y, obtaining X plus U inner product with Y, and then I can remove uh, uh, from this, I can remove this quantity here, which I have, which is the key, so only the person with the key should be able to decrypt. And what we will get is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get the inner product of X with Y, and this uh, will cancel. Because, it, uh, because of the linearity of the inner product, U comes out of the inner product. Uh, and why is this secure? So the goal, remember, it will be to only leak X, Y, and not any other information about X. Um, the, way, the reason why it works is because if we look at what the adversary sees, the adversary sees X plus U, the ciphertext, the decryption key UI, and Y. And this uh, is distributed exactly in the same way as uh, a uniformly random vector W instead of the ciphertext. The inner product of W is Y minus XY. And if you look at this in this, uh, in this final game, you can imagine this is the game, um, here in this world, the adversary doesn't, uh, the only information that the adversary can ever hope to obtain about X is uh, this W completely. I mean, there is no information in the ciphertext about X anymore. And the only information about X here in this world is the inner product of X with Y, which is exactly what we were hoping to, to, to achieve. So we have, uh, we have security for one ciphertext and one, uh, one ciphertext query and one input. And now let's see how do we go to many inputs. This is uh, very easy to parallelize. We just, uh, instead of having uh, only one U, we will uh, have N U's, N vector U's. So bigger master secret key. Uh, and uh, to encrypt, we on, on slot I, we will just make, uh, make the, the, the one-time pad of XI plus U, plus UI. It's exactly the same. The only thing that changes a little bit is the, is the key generation. And because now we have a sum and um, uh, before it was just UI. So now we have the sum over all the, all the I's of UI, YI. Um, and the reason why it works is, of course, because of the linearity of the inner product. Um, all these sums actually come out, all the UI's, uh, YI come out, and uh, in the end they cancel, so we are left with uh, our goal, the inner product of the big vectors. So this is how we do for uh, how we do it, if you had many input sources and one ciphertext query per, uh, per source. And now let's go to step three. Now we want to see how do we achieve security only on one input and only one from one, if you have only one input source, so this is basically just single input uh, functional encryption, normal functional encryption, uh, but with many, supporting many ciphertext queries. Uh, and this is actually, uh, uh, this uh, line of work actually started in 2015 with a work by Abdallah, Burst, De Caro, and Juan Cheval, um, uh, in which they, uh, they showed that the inner product functional encryption for one slot uh, uh, can, can be constructed. 
And the way it works here, I will uh, present it for a uh, group, prime group G of uh, order Q. Uh, the master secret key remains the same. So it's still a uniform vector V from ZQM. The encryption now, though, changes a little bit. It's, uh, we will draw a uniform random R, a uniform scalar R, so R is scalar, X and V here are vectors. So everything with color is a vector, and if you don't have a color, it's probably not a vector. <laughs> uh, so we have G to the R and G to the X plus RV. The key gen remains the same. And the, the hope is, like, if we try to argue security in a very intuitive way, the hope is that our, this RV here will, from DDH assumption, uh, will look like a uniformly random vector for each new X, for each new encryption, and it will behave like a one-time path. So this is actually uh, a generalization of LKML, a nice generalization of LKML. Uh, so this is how you do it for DDH. Uh, but it can also, using, uh, for example, uh, this 2016 paper by uh, Agaval, Libels, Libers, Sele, uh, we can um, uh, do, we can make this step also from uh, LWE or DCR. And actually, if uh, this step, um, it's more efficient if you do it with these assumptions than with the DDH. Uh, and what I can say here also is the fact that here we cannot really hope for, um, uh, here we have to rely on computational assumption at this step. We cannot mask all these messages, uh, all these queries just from the master secret key. It's not enough. So let's look at the big run map and let's see how to put everything together now. Um, we saw how to do it, uh, how to do, how to achieve a scheme that has, uh, that can achieve security for one separate text query and one input. Then we saw that just by making the sums, we can make, we can uh, bootstrap this to many inputs, but only one separate text query per input. Uh, in parallel, we have seen how to do this uh, only for one input source, how to support multiple separate text queries. Uh, here, just LGML. Now, uh, putting everything together, we, the master secret key will be the master secret key from step two. So we'll have the UIs, be the master secret key from step three, we'll have the VIs. And uh, the, the encryption is a double layer encryption. So encrypting in step four, uh, in, the, in, the, in the scheme four, it's not really step four, it's scheme four uh, vector X will be just, oh, this was XI, oh, there's always a type. <laughs> So it's XI, yeah. Uh, so encrypting uh, uh, XI in uh, step four then uh, is just the encryption uh, in step two. So here this one uses uh, uh, UI, and then to this encryption we apply encryption in step three, the one that uses V. And the reason why this works, that why we can do this double layer encryption is because the outputs of uh, the of ENC2 are compatible with the inputs of ENC3. So you have to work a little bit to, to make sure that this to fit. Uh, and uh, the, the key generation, which will just be the key generation in step two, this sum of UIs, YIs, this is exactly the one here. But on the YI side, things change a little bit. We need to apply key gen three on the YIs. So why does it work? We can argue um, that everything decrypts correctly by just, um, so first you want to, you decrypt the outer layer, we decrypt ENC3 ENC by using KGN3. So decrypting the outer layer, uh, the correctness of this comes just from the correctness of scheme three. And decrypting the, 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 the inner layer, the ENC2, uh, will come because uh, this, after we, we got rid of the ENC3, we are only left with ENC2 and the key gen from step two so uh, by the correctness of, uh, of step two, we can uh, decrypt uh, completely. But of course, I mean, here we can put other schemes, we can put LWE, then it becomes a little bit more complicated, or BCR. Uh, but this is the, 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 the big picture. Uh, so to conclude, what do we achieve? We have a construction with our pairings. Um, Compared to the previous work, we removed the need for bilinear groups. Um, just as them, we achieve adaptive security. Um, we support larger message spaces. Why is this? It's because um, uh, if, you, if you use DDH, 
then um, the message is encrypted in the oh, what is this? the message is encrypted in the in the exponent. So you'll have some kind of bound on how big x can be, uh, which you don't have if you rely on a w or dcr. So we can support more and more assumptions, and we have more efficient schemes. Uh, and uh, we, of course, just as the previous work, we achieve a polynomial number of slots. Uh, we can uh, we have security for a polynomial number of, of inputs, but uh, only relying on uh, uh, on polynomial hardness assumptions. And now I talk a little bit about uh, our second contribution, the function hiding scheme. Here, the security goal is that if you have uh, the encryption of x and uh, the decryption key of y. What is being linked is just the inner product of x, y, size of x, but now this time y is hidden as well. Um, so we do this by, uh, by, uh, uh, by applying an idea which, was, which first appeared in the paper by Lina and Vanko uh, of double layer encryption. Um, we still have to, have to rely on bilinear groups uh, but uh, what is nice is that the scheme is adaptively secure and achieve for many many uh, uh, inputs. Uh, and comparing this to previous work, um, um, we started from this scheme and we build up on it and we, we, uh, we have almost the same efficiency but uh, this time uh, we also achieve function hiding for almost for free. Um, and um, yeah, I, did, I forgot to mention but the pairing free construction is also almost for free. <laughs> Um, and compared with this paper, for, uh, which is concurrent work, uh, uh, we, uh, they, have, um, they have they achieved things in a better model uh, and also a little bit more efficient. Uh, so yeah, FH here is just that fact that the function is, that they have function hiding. So now I'm ready to conclude, I think. Yes, um, I can finish with an open problem. Is it possible to adapt our techniques to, for other classes of functions? Just that linear products, so quadratic functions, uh, general polynomials, even more. Uh, this is a very interesting question. So, thank you. Have questions?